Right, well, hello everybody. Um, my title, The Natural History of the River Ask, Past and Present. I think it's rather nice that we use the term natural history to describe the study of wildlife. And today I'm really going to be talking about the history of the natural history in, at some of the ways in which riverine species have interacted over time and including the role of human beings in the process. I'll be drawing on information gained by a lifetime of interest in the river and I've also received valuable support from a number of different people and organizations as indicated here. I'd particularly like to thank Keith Noble at the bottom of the list there um, for the very generous way he has encouraged me to use some of his superb photographs in this talk. I was born in Crick Howell and through the 1940s and 1950s spring and summer holidays were always spent in a family house beside the River Usk in Clangunida. Each year, each holiday, we would establish an aquarium and stock it with plants fish and other creatures from the river and also from the adjacent uh, Brecon and Abergavenny Canal. I'm the one with the back to the camera, aged about 10 at this time. And um, some of you will know my brother William. Oh, there we are. Someone will know my brother William with darker hair than he has now. Uh, and a couple of my other brothers also in the photograph. Subsequently, throughout my life, I have returned to the Usk whenever I could, and since 2002, my wife Liz and I have lived very near it full time. Over the years, fly fishing for trout has been one of my pastimes, but I would say that of greater importance has simply been messing about by, on, or in the river, supported by family members and friends. As everyone will know, the state of the UK rivers is currently of great concern. And for the ask, this was brought into focus in 2021 by the publication of an, onla an online publication, A Dying River, the State of the River Usk, produced by Guy Mole, a very well-respected former fisheries officer. And that is available online at Avonis Cymru website. In this publication, Guy took various wildlife features that make the River Usk special and considered how they were faring. He drew attention to some sets of data, principally on catches of various or electrofishing data on various species of fish. I read this document with great interest and over the last two years, I've been looking at the information he presents, related it to my own knowledge of the river, and tried to determine what gaps of knowledge there are and how they could be filled. And in part, this has involved setting up a project with the Biodiversity Information Service for this area, funded via the Wildlife Trust for South and West Wales. Now, this more quantitative approach is really only just beginning. So today I'm going to seek to give a flavor of the subject, a personal snapshot of some of the ecologically important species. Here is a map of the river and its tributaries within the National Park and also within an adjacent part of Breconshire, now of course Powys. And this was provided by Sarah Woodcock of the Biodiversity Information Service. Much of the area, that's the main river and the tributaries, are designated as a special area of conservation. And the abbreviation SAC, I should be using quite a lot during the course of this talk. And just to help orientation, Brecon is shown here. This picture shows an aerial view 
of our patch of the river, I can say, if I can so call it, downstream from Langanada Bridge. At this point, the river thro flows through something of a gorge, and you can see that the river is broken up by shelves of rock into pools and rapids. There are many trees on the river bank, uh, indeed on the pronounced river terrace that uh, is to be found on both sides of the river, and indeed there are history of earlier river terraces often wooded a little bit further back from the river bank. And behind the banks of trees, you can see that the land is essentially pasture, fields of pasture. Now, I should stress that both up and downstream from um, this particular section, the so-called Buckland Gorge, um, there are places where the river is losing height uh, less rapidly and where the farmland, whether pasture or arable, is closer to the water's edge than we see it here. Now, in thinking of the ecology of the Usk, we must remember that it is a spate river characterized by sudden dramatic floods. We've already had a reference to the effect of the flood in 2020 on Krakow. Here is a picture taken in Langanada showing the river far above its normal height. It's in fact already gone down very slightly. The high tide mark is just there. So it's already dropped a bit from its maximum. The red-brown color comes from the soil, predominantly derived from the old red sandstones that underlie much of the catchment. Now, the wildlife of the river has evolved to cope with spates, of course, and throughout my life I've known that a day of rain will result in a tomato soup-colored torrent. I should, however, say that some of the flood-caused vegetation stripping, the removal of vegetation of recent years has been outside my general experience. In considering the natural history, I will begin, as did Guy Mole, with what is described as a habitat feature of the River Usk Special Area of Conservation. And this is habitat is created by a, an aquatic plant, water crowfoot, which is within the um, buttercup, buttercup genus Ranunculus. This is the plant itself with its finely divided submerged leaves and sometimes white buttercup-like flowers on the surface. Now in places on the lower usk, below Abergavenny and thus outside the National Park, growth of water crowfoot does indeed create a habitat. This is a picture taken last year by Andy Caron of the Gwent Wildlife Trust showing ranunculus at Newbridge on Wye. And I think you can see here the submerged masses of the green aquatic weed separated by areas of shingle and therefore creating a rather special kind of habitat. However, within the National Park, things are different. And this is recognized in the 2008 core plan for the SAC, which stated that except on one tributary, that's the Seni, this kind of ranunculus growth does not provide a key habitat. By contrast, or if you like, the river and stream habitats in the park are principally provided by shells of rock or banks of stone and shingle without there being big masses of submerged water weeds to create a specific kind of ecological conditions. I'm now going to move on to some of the animals of the river, beginning with the small invertebrates, invertebrates of course being animals without backbones, and examples are mayflies, or sometimes called upwinged flies, caddis fly, and the freshwater shrimp. Those are the three examples I'm going to take. The mayflies, or upwinged flies, are very important uh, inhabitants of unpolluted upland rivers. And on the usk, the most famous type of mayfly is the march brown. Here is the adult insect, and you get some idea it's really quite a large 
uh, example in the mayfly group, see the two, two centimeter scale at the bottom. Now historically this was abundant on the USC. It then became very rare and there were real concerns that it might be extinct. However, it's good to be able to say that in some recent years at least, the YNUS Foundation, which acts to monitor quite a lot of data, has had a good number of reports of this fine insect. The larvae or, or nymphs of the March Brown dwell in the water and like those of many other mayfly species are flattened and so they're able to cling onto stones in fast flowing water. In other words, they're adapted to the conditions provided in fast flowing streams. The caddis fly, here's the adult, often known as a sedge, quite different as you can see with the wings folded back along the body. They are really remarkable creatures. The um, head and thorax are, if you like, protected. You can see the head on the left with legs and, and the antennae. But the body itself is soft and vulnerable. And it spins a silken sheath around itself. And to this is attached a protective covering of sand grains or bits of shell, I think these must be bits of shell here, or sometimes types of leaf. And this is according to species. You can identify the type of caddis from the protective covering that it has. Here's a rather complicated picture. The extreme left is the head again. And uh, this case, it's got a real mixture of um, body, oh, uh, cocoon, uh, not cocoon, but coverings created in part by little bits of gravel, but back here, as you can see, by a, a bit of leaf. So that's a very striking and common feature. Turn over a stone in the usk and its tributaries, you will often find either this mobile form of caddis, but there's also another type that secretes itself to the stone. So you turn over the stone and there is the case attached to the underside of the stone. Always turn the stone back again, by the way. It's very important that stones are returned to the uh, orientation they previously had. We now come on to the freshwater shrimp, or gamerus, the Latin name. This is an also a very important component of the invertebrate ecosystem. From personal experience, I know something of the way in which the abundance of this creature as a component has changed over the years. During the 1970s and 1980s, I became conscious that the shrimp populations in the river were much higher than they had been when I was younger. So as one disturbed, uh, for example, the water-covered black moss that you get on a, a great deal of the rocky outcrops and so on in the river, clouds of shrimp would appear and swim about. And then in the last 20 years, it's clear that they've become less abundant again. That's not very do well documented in quantitative terms, but I have no doubt that it's a, a, a striking feature of the way shrimp populations have changed over a 60-year period. All these creatures are vital to the food chain. They need clear, unpolluted water. And in addition to general and industrial pollution, I am thinking in terms of pollution of some of the very toxic chemicals used for the control of pests in farm animals or domestic pets. And currently on the market, I know the Wyanus Foundation is very concerned about this, is a compound that some dog owners use to control mites. And if treated dogs then leap into the river and splash about, huge numbers of invertebrates may be killed as a result of the insect, of the um, uh, chemical being released into the water. Moving on from invertebrates to vertebrates and, and to fish, the minnow, by far the most commonly observed fish in the usk as I know it, is the minnow, and they can form large shoals, usually in the quieter patches of water. Most minnows are very small, there's a scale three centimeters there, but they can grow as large as eight to set 10 centimeters in length. Then we have the loach. This is a bottom living fish. It has the characteristic little barbel by its mouth. 
And um, as you can see, as I say, it's bottom uh, feeding and often encountered under stones, turnover of stone, there's very good likelihood of finding a loach underneath. And then perhaps in terms of this talk of special interest is the miller's thumb or bullhead as it's called here. Miller's thumb because as you can see it's swollen head reminiscent of the poor miller who's crushed his thumb in his grinding stones at some stage during his life. The, the bullhead, again it's a bottom living fish and uh, here it, you, I, it's on a pale background so you can sh see the shape rather well. Here Again, I think you can perhaps see how well camouflaged it is against stones and shingle on the, on the river bed. The bullhead is specially mentioned in the SAC designation because the Usk population represents the southern part of its range in Wales. And there are definitely some surveys to show that it is declining and I consider it to be much less common than it was when stones are turned over in fast flowing clear sections of the river. We now move on to the trout, the fish for which the usk is most famous. As long ago as 1188, Geraldus Cambrensis, Gerald of Wales, traveled through much of Wales and commented on the fish in the Usk and Wye rivers. So he refers to the salmon and trout of the Wye and Usk in his two of his books, his journey through Wales and his description of Wales. He comments that the Wye is more celebrated for its salmon, but the Usk is more celebrated for its trout. Here's a picture of a fish which has been caught and is about to be released again. Trout do not form shoals, like I've said the minnow does, but they take up their positions in the current and wait for their food, mayflies, shrimps and so on, to be carried down to them in the current when they snap it up. The bigger fish take the best places, and if that place is vacated, if, for example, the, the trout is caught and removed from the river, that spot would be very quickly taken over by another large trout. And the small fish have to take the best places they can, usually in little runnels uh, towards the edge of the stream. The historic basis of fly fishing for trout is the creation of an artificial fly that resembles the original insect sufficiently well to deceive the trout into going for it. And here's an interesting example, a nice example of an artificial March Brown. You can see how closely it resembles the real thing. What about changes in numbers of trout over the years? In his report, Guy Mole presents data to show that numbers of trout as assessed by the NRW, Natural Resources Wales Electrofishing Survey, of the tributaries, numbers have fallen by about two thirds over the last 40 years. And where available information on the numbers of fish actually caught, and, and he, he cites, uh, I think probably it's himself, his own catches, he doesn't say that, a fisherman uh, going out over a 40 year period or so, where available uh, information on numbers of fish caught seem to tell a similar story. Before I stop talking about trout, I would just like to show a picture from the Brecknock Museum's collection, a stuffed six pound trout. Such large trout eat other fish. They're often called cannibals, but as it's been pointed out, this is a little unfair because there are lots of different kinds of fish in their diet, though they certainly will include young trout. This was caught on the Cray Reservoir, on, on of course, on a upper tributary of the Usk and it allows one to make the point that reservoirs do create a very different kind of aquatic habitat from the valley streams, the streams at the foot of the various valleys that they replaced. Going on now to salmon, which is also a designated SAC species for the us, the Atlantic salmon. Guy Mole reported that 
NRW had found that the adult salmon, or declared that the adult salmon in the USK is now in the technical category, probably at risk. And despite the use of hatcheries, which have been used a lot uh, in, 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 uh, over many years and, and including recent years, young salmon are now scarce or absent in many of the sites where they were present not many years ago. This is a picture of, of two of the mature fish leaping a cataract. It wasn't taken on the USK. I uh, expect some of you saw the, uh, the um, David Attenborough series, Wild Isles, where they uh, took a lot of trouble to find a place where they could see salmon gathering and leaping um, as they came upstream. And as I'm sure most of you will know, mature salmon return from the sea to breed in the headwaters of the river in which they were born. The young fish, known as par, having been, the eggs having been laid in the, in the smaller streams of, of a particular river, the young fish grow up in the river, feed there, and eventually migrate to the sea, where they then grow significantly to reach maturity. And then they will return, as we saw in the earlier slide. The status of the salmon in the USK, as elsewhere in the UK, changed with the development of game fishing in the 18th and 19th century. It's an odd situation that the adult salmon, once it has returned to the river to breed, doesn't actually feed at all. So the question here comes, how do you catch it with a, a lure? Uh, however, it can be excited into snapping at a brightly colored artificial fly, or artificial lure, and this is the basis of the sport. And here are some pictures again from the Brecknock Museum collection. I'll focus in on a couple of them. And you can see that they're brightly colored and highly artificial in appearance. And so it's somehow irritating the salmon that makes it snap at it and leads the fishermen to have a chance of catching it. The high profile of salmon fishing in the 18th and 19th century and the importance of it to the landowner led to significant changes in river management. Job opportunities were provided for river keepers, but there were also, not surprisingly, often fierce rivalries between these people and, and the local inhabitants. In fact, very interestingly, gamekeepers would not be local because they could well therefore come into conflict or maybe lead to being, thought to be encouraging the locals to go out and, and poach fish. The locals would sometimes take to the spawning beds in these, these shallow water of the spawning beds with salmon spears like this one. You can see there's a, a barb on, I think perhaps it's broken off the other two times, my, the feeling would be that there would be a barb on every time. This is a salmon spear from the Brecknock Museum. And um, here is a dramatic picture. I think it comes from a headwater of the, of the Y of a masked figure by torchlight who has obviously gaffed a salmon that was in the process of spawning. I'm now going to move on to eels. Eels are extremely tough fish, which can live in a very wide variety of freshwater habitats, often quite polluted ones. This slide shows the yellow eel stage, which is what one finds in the rivers. And again, as I'm sure many of you will know, spawning takes place in the Western Atlantic, most likely in the Sargasso Sea, near the Bahamas, and the tiny eel larvae drift towards Europe in a 300-day migration. Unlike salmon, they are not specific to any particular river. Once they, if you like, pitch up in the estuaries, they become pigmented and metamorphose into elvers, which are miniature versions of the adult eels, and then they start to migrate upstream. And uh, there's a good 1940s description for the upriver up migration in a tributary of the Usk, uh, in which, I'm more or less quoting here, the procession of elvers formed a lane about a foot wide and continued hour after hour 
for several days, and it was described as like tape on a ticker tape machine, which perhaps is a rather period observation. Now, the eel was never a sport fish, but it was seen as cheap, nutritious, and a readily available food source. It could easily be caught on a line, but as any of you who've tried to remove it from the hook will know, its slipperiness can be the very devil. As a result, there were various other techniques developed to capture and kill uh, eels for food. And this again from the Bracknock Museum and Art Gallery is an example of an eel spear. And you'll see that the tines are much closer together than they were with the salmon spear. And there are many little reverse hooks I I I I um, designed to make sure that the eel doesn't wriggle off and escape. <clears throat> During the last 25 years, there has been a very severe decline in the abundance of eels, down around 98%. And it's now a matter, certainly to me, of great excitement to see one, whereas in my childhood and in the childhood of my children, there would be an eel under almost every big stone in the river that you turned over. The NRW has closed all commercial fisheries for eels and elvers in Wales, and anglers must return alive any eels they catch. I'm now going on from fish to an amphibian, the common toad, which is a species of special interest to me. Toads spend most of their um, life on most of the year on land, of course, but return to fresh water to breed. And there are particular populations of toads which will congregate in certain shallow pools on the usk. Toads show a remarkable faithfulness to their breeding sites, converging in large numbers uh, in certain places while avoiding other bodies of water that seem perfectly suitable. For example, the Brecon and Abergavenny Canal doesn't have these toads breeding it in the same way. And you think they arrive at this canal, think, what's this wretched body of water doing? Swim furiously across to migrate on down to the riverbank, even though the canal itself would probably offer a perfectly good breeding spot. So they're very conservative and will gather at certain places year after year. Here is the male, the smaller male, on top of a larger female, and you can see running down to the bottom the chain of spawn that they have produced. And here again is a female pretty well overwhelmed by a large number of male suitors. Again, you can see the chains of spawn. The tadpoles take two to three months to develop. Here's a lively population in a shallow pool on the usk, and um, usually by the end of June, they, they have completed their metamorphosis and migrated, started to migrate away from the river. I've been following the ups and downs of toad breeding in the usk for the last 25 years. There are advantages to breeding in the river over, say, breeding in a pond, because in the river there are relatively few predatory insects like um, dragonfly larvae or, or water boatmen. However, the tadpoles can die if the pool dries out, if the water level drops away, and uh, the adults, the tadpoles and the adults, could, can of course be washed away in a sudden spate. Toads, eels and other fish, toads, eels and other kinds of fish, provide food for one of the most loved of all the river creatures, the otter. And this is a picture not taken on the ass but a very fine one by Andy Caron of the Gwent Wildlife Trust. This is one, the otter is one of the river usks SAC species. For otters to thrive, they need an abundant supply of food and a high water quality habitat. And in a river, this may be provided by islands in the river or riparian woodland along, in other words, woodland alongside. As is well known, otters declined in the middle of the 20th century due to the widespread use of organochlorine pesticides. And the populations recovered when these pesticides were withdrawn. Although there are recent worries that things may be slipping back a bit, here is a lovely picture of three otters in the Usk near Brecon, taken by Keith Noble 
in January 2022. I feel I should say a few words about otter hunting, looking at the river from its historical perspective, since it was once a significant feature of the Usk, as of many other rivers. A special type of dog was bred for otter hunting, and here is a picture from the museum's collection of four, I think it is, otter hounds swimming the river in pursuit of their prey. The huntsmen would poke out the holts where the otters would rest up with their sticks, and the hunt followers would then stand guard in the river to try and stop the otter from escaping. I remember very well the huntsmen who came to the Usk with their bright blue jackets and bright blue trousers and scarlet socks, ties and caps. And I now know, I didn't know then, they were the Hawkston Hunt from Shropshire. Each hunt had its own special outfit. And on the internet, not least just preparing for this lecture, I found this gruesome image of a stuffed otter wearing that very uniform. Opposition to otter hunting on grounds of its cruelty goes back to the 1890s, and it was finally made illegal in 1978. David Jones Powell has pointed out to me that well before this on the USK, there was a very strong campaign against hunting, and Dr. David Kyle of the Breckenshire Wildlife Trust uh, successfully encouraged many riparian owners to take a stance against the hunt. And so, if you like, the hunt lost, lost its lifeblood. My brother William, you saw a picture of him much earlier on, remembers how in the mid-1960s, and while he was still a university student, he denied a belligerent master of otter hounds access to the stretch of river downstream from Plangana to Bridge. The uh, master said something like, I'll something well do what I like, when William said, you aren't allowed on this stretch of the river, but he, he, he uh, did in fact give way. Just a few words about birds. Again, thanks very much to Keith Noble for his photographs. The dipper is really the iconic species of clear, fast-flowing fast upland streams. It feeds principally on aquatic invertebrates, like the mayfly nymph and the caddisfly larvae, and so dipper populations must be a useful measure of the vitality of the water invertebrate populations. The kingfisher, by contrast, eats, as the name suggests, mainly fish. Minnows and sticklebacks are specifically mentioned, although in the usk it must be mainly minnows because sticklebacks as I know from many, many years of fishing with a net, are rare in the Usk. They do occur more now than they did when I was a boy, but I don't quite know where that should be. I do want to mention the goosander, which is a saw-billed duck that I never knew in my youth. Here is the adult male. Here are two of the youngsters, well-developed youngsters. And here is a picture of a mother with the chicks. There's an interesting history here. Native in Scandinavia, so it's a European species, it only started breeding in the British Isles in Scotland in the 19th century, and since then, or after that, it spread southwards across northern England into Wales. And this occurred despite attempts which were legal in Scotland to reduce its numbers by shooting. Just two breeding pairs were recorded in Wales in 1975, according to the records I've found, but now it is very widely established. It's a striking addition to our wildlife, although it must be said that it's a voracious and very effective predator of fish, with a family group often working as a pack. Mention of fish-eating birds brings me on to the recent sighting of ospreys. Here is a picture taken by Keith Noble on Langorse Lake just a few weeks ago of the osprey with a fish in its talons. And there's now an official report by Breckenshire bird recorder Andy King, who, who is here in the audience today, that the pair have constructed a nest very near the usk. The hope is that next year there will be breeding, the first for possibly 250 years. 
I'm a botanist by training, and I started with a plant, the water crowfoot, and I'm going to end with one, the globe flower. Again, a member of the buttercup family, and a beautiful one at that. The globe flower is just at the southern end of its range in our part of Wales, and it finds a suitable habitat in some places along the rocky riverbanks of the Usk. Long may it thrive. Now, there's a lot I haven't had time to touch upon. Indigenous fish like the lamprey with its strange feeding and breeding behavior, introduced mammals like the mink, introduced plants like Himalayan balsam with its impact on other elements of riparian vegetation. But I'm going to end this talk with the recent BIS appeal for more records. This uh, is going out or has been going out over the last few weeks. Wanted River Usk wildlife records, new and old, dead or alive. Have you any wildlife records in diaries, lists, phones, reports? If so, please let the Biodiversity Information Service know about them and the details there. For those of us actively interested in this whole topic, it's our hope that increased knowledge, with increased knowledge, will come increased opportunities for the National Park to meet the objectives we've been hearing about in terms of topics such as climate change, water and nature recovery. Thank you.